Um, okay, so uh, my my uh, my in-laws are like an old school Charleston family. Um, they're like West Virginian to the core, and they had a name for Pittsburgh, which wasn't very nice. Uh, I think it was a it's the college football rivalry, right? I think for too long West Virginians have looked at Pittsburgh as being, you know. But they're kidding themselves, right? Those, those days are long gone. And you go up to Pittsburgh now, and it's a thriving, um, incredibly fun city. It's economically strong. It's just an amazing place to be. Um, I love Pittsburgh, and it's, it's being up here in Morgantown, one of the greatest things about it is being close to such a thriving community. Um, I'm interested to know how that happened. Uh, I know it wasn't all just serendipity, and there's some um, smart, savvy organizing going on, particularly in terms of the creative and tech communities. And so um, I want to hear from the people today that were behind that, learn a little bit about them. So um, let's do some quick introductions first, if you wouldn't mind. I'm Jim DeNova with the Benetton Foundation. I'm Kim Chesney. I'm the Director of Creative Industries Acceleration at the Pittsburgh Technology Council. Ryan Lammy, the Executive Director of Radiant Hall Studios. We provide affordable studio space to artists in three different locations in Pittsburgh. Nina Barbudo, and I'm the founder and director of Assemble, and it's a community space for arts and technology. All right, and so Jim, you were going to um, just say a few words to sort of frame this whole conversation. What's, what's the thread that ties this group of people together who are sitting here? So it all started, really, Kim and the Tech Council started looking at the intersection of art and technology and how that can be an economic driver for the region. So the Creative Industries Network really started as an industry uh, sector cluster around first the digital arts, because there were a lot of startup companies that were animators and game designers and simulators. Uh, and it quickly expanded to include all arts and artisans. So Kim has organized a network to show what kind of businesses can be started and grown and cultivated where there's technology, uh, aesthetic, traditional aesthetic arts, and forming a, a unified kind of industry cluster where business supports can be exchanged and ideas exchanged. So one of the things the Tech Council did was start to look at connecting business supports like shared workspaces, like Ryan's um, incubators for artists, along with loan programs and entrepreneurship programs, and really just connect his five, uh, network together. And one of the things that I think represents uh, what this industry cluster really looks like are the kind of businesses that grow out of individual artists who want to grow businesses or the, or technologists that want to look at the next digital art or product for the film industry. And I hope, I want to show the video, yeah, sure. because there's a short video, and it illustrates the companies. So it's a good case example of the companies that are all based in Pittsburgh. A lot of them are nationally recognized, but they grew out of the organization of this industry cluster. <laughs>
All right, so, man, we get the idea there's a lot happening in uh, Pittsburgh. Um, in a lot of ways, Kim, that represents kind of where Pittsburgh is now. I'm really interested to hear about the early days of forming the network, right? This uh, creative technology network. What did that look like? Like, what were those first steps to trying to do some of that work? What was the reception you had from the city or from people or from businesses? Um, and I asked that as a sort of a way to just to give some tips for anyone in West Virginia feeling like they want to start to take some of those first steps. Yeah, um, well, I got a lot of hate mail in the beginning. Um, you'd be surprised at how many people You'd be surprised at how many people don't um, really get the intersection of arts and creativity and business and innovation. It's something that really over the last 10 years, you know, I assume now that like everybody thinks that way, but they don't. Um, and it, it, particularly 10 years ago, uh, it was a different climate. A lot of people were still much more siloed, working in their little groups and not talking to each other. And the whole idea to start this whole thing start because I, I, my background was I'm a fine artist. I'm an oil painter as far as you could possibly be from the technology and innovation world. But I worked at the Technology Council, so it seemed like a natural combination for me. And you know, one day we had this idea, like, why don't we just put together an exhibition of all the art and technology that's going on in Pittsburgh? Like, let's just put a call out there and see what's happening. And Geez, we like ended up breaking fire code. We had over 500 people respond. I don't think anybody knew what they were going to expect, what they were going to see. It was like, what is this going to be? But they came, and it was packed, and it was crazy. And we realized that we were on to something important because nobody else was doing this, and people were interested. And that was the most important thing, that whatever that intersection was, people were really interested in finding it out. So. You know, we really spent the last 10 years kind of developing and exploring that intersection and, and fine-tuning what is now the Creative Industries Network. We started out as the Art and Technology Initiative, but really branched out to focus more on the creative industries in general. Our, our, the gap that we fill is really for empowering creatives to be entrepreneurs and for artists to be business people and for innovation in the arts to go hand in hand. You know, we feel really strongly that artists should be able to make a living doing what they do and should be respected for what they do. Um, so all the things that we do, including the Create Festival, is to showcase all of the things that are happening in our region in that regard and also to teach people and empower people to do these things for themselves. Ryan, uh, I want to learn a bit more about you. And uh, what was your, what was it about this network or the organizations in Pittsburgh that are at, that are at work that enabled you as an artist and as, a, and as an organizer to do the things that you are able to do? So I actually, um, I was a Pittsburgh native and actually went to New York for five and a half years and then came back to Pittsburgh. So I was what they call the boomerang. Um, but really I learned a lot of, what I do now in New York, and I kind of brought it back to Pittsburgh, but um, really, instead of just kind of taking all the ideas from New York and, imply, and applying them to Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh has a very specific community and uh, support network and um, structure that it operates within. And so when I came back to Pittsburgh, I was just trying to access that network and get to know a lot of professionals that were working um, from Pittsburgh, but still had connections to other cities. And so I spent a full year just networking and getting to know different people. What, did, what does that networking look like? Like Googling, going to happy hours? Like what, what physically, what is it? Social events. Um, I mean, I, I still do a lot of networking now, but when you're new to a place, the best thing you can possibly do is just to be, be obnoxious and get out there and know as many people as you can. And if, if you don't have a reason for, for saying hi to somebody, you need to make one up um, and just find some kind of leverage point where you can start having these conversations with different people. Um, but it wasn't, Radiant Hall didn't start until I found a space that could accommodate my own art practice. I asked a few friends of mine to move in with me um, and there were just five or six of us that were renting a small studio space in a place called Lawrenceville, which is a part of the, the Pittsburgh area. Um, but it was really kind of like a, a slow grassroots kind of uh, movement where we, we started with one space and 
the, the building that we were in allowed us to expand within that structure and take over more spaces. So in, in the course of a year, we went from five artists being in one studio space to about 24 artists in the whole building. What's Radiant Hole? Give us the, uh, give us the elevator pitch. So uh, Radiant Hole's mission is to create and preserve studio environments for working artists. Uh, being in, in New York and parts of Brooklyn for five years, um, one of the biggest issues was rapid development and artists being pushed out of spaces that, um, that they had occupied for 10 to 20 years and they were really the reason why those areas started to de develop originally. Uh, and they were just kicked out of those spaces almost overnight, they were evicted um, and they really had no control but they were all kind of in the same position. And so when 100 artists in a warehouse get evicted, they have to go somewhere and they just continue to get pushed out. And so Radiant Hall's mission is to set up um, long-term leases that secure these spaces to, to initially set up the platform. And then our second phase is actually to acquire new buildings that we can transition that population into. And so the organization is all about creating a smooth transition from spaces that we don't own or, or have any equity investment in and kind of how do we preserve those for future generations and make sure that the artists aren't being pushed around. I see my photographer friend Christian Thacker sitting here going, hmm, he's in a big building by himself in Fairmont, the FBI building in Fairmont, a lot of potential. Um, Nina. Uh, tell the people here what, what you do and, and your connection to the network and how it's helped you do some cool things in Pittsburgh. Oh, sure. Um, so, again, I run a space called Assemble, a community space for arts and technology. Um, I started it in 2011, and similarly to Ryan, I had moved back to Pittsburgh from other places. And I was living in LA, and I got to be there for the recession, and it was wonderful. And my own background um, is architecture. And architecture is art and technology. It's science, technology, engineering, art, and math all put together, and project-based learning, and all these things that we use to talk about education these days. But it's always been in architecture, but there's not been communication from that, that silo, right? Um, so actually, in like 2010, I was trying to figure out like, how do I make this happen? I moved back just in time for the whole snowmageddon. I don't know if that, you guys remember that? Like yeah, pain. Do you all have that pain inside you with that memory? So like, <laughs> you know, there's there's different barriers that ha were arising in my own life. And I was like, oh, I have this idea. and I really want to make this happen. And I'm going to start a gallery and it'll have a studio. And we didn't have the word maker space at that time, but it was a place to come and make things and to realize like all these different systems that other people have created around us. Like we can too change those systems and those systems fail, sometimes they work, but we have the power as humans to change other things that other humans have made. So um, I only had a bicycle at this time and I at, was, someone was like, oh, you have to talk to Kim at the tech council because you're doing stuff with technology. Also, there's like a tech council and then the art council and they're two different things. And so they're like, well, what, what is it that you fit into? And we're like, all of them, <laughs> maybe. So I had a wonderful meeting with Kim. And um, I was very surprised she didn't think I was totally crazy. And she helped to, and you were still formulating yeah. this too. This was like very much like same time. same time. And so I was like, I need to make this happen. Who can we talk to? And so Kim. And this is something that happens in Pittsburgh. Like you ask someone, they will meet with you because you're a human and you respond to your emails and don't message them on Facebook Messenger. Be professional. And, and they'll meet with you for coffee or just to you know talk and share ideas. And we did that. And you gave me pathways to other people, just to just other emails or email introductions, right? Pass them off to the next person. Long story short, because <laughs> there's many different things that happened along the way. Assemble is now seven. 
We just hired our second full-time employee, which is a lot, and it's hard to make jobs. And um, I was working as a volunteer, as the board president, and I had to apply for the job. I just want to throw that out there. But I was working as a volunteer until 2015 and working at the Carnegie Science Center full-time and other roles. And I also teach at Carnegie Mellon in the School of um, Architecture and through the ID8 program. But Assemble is a startup nonprofit, and we, we envision a world of artists, makers, technologists, and learners to come together, build confidence through making, connect, create, learn and transform together. Now I know that's really heady, but it can happen with glue, tape, and it can also happen with robots and glitter at any age. And I'm sure that it, it, we wanna make a space where everyone can identify and identify themselves, not be identified, but identify themselves as someone who can make a change. So what would it look like if I was up in Pittsburgh uh, tomorrow morning with my wife and three-year-old and we walked into Assemble, what would we see? What would we hear? What would it look tomorrow like? Morning. Um, nothing tomorrow morning. But um, if you came next week, you'd see summer camp, which is crazy. And our summer camp that we have is for 11 to 13-year-olds next week. And it's called Utopia, spelled Y-O-U-topia. And the students are going to be working on creating not only like the future of themselves, but the future of the world around them. And they're also going to be working with like just simple things from um, just like, you know, painting and some simple electronics and LEDs, but they're going to get into virtual reality too um, because that's how they know how to work and they're going to make their own Snapchat filters and because this is the language that they speak and we should be working with them and what they like. Um, so the elephant in the room is that there is a foundation guy sitting here on the end. Um, Jim is a VP at Benidorm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm her. Uh, um, so, Absolute worst, man. <laughs> So foundations care about the you know, strength and vibrancy of their cities and their communities. Um, why do you care? You know, what's, what's, why do you support, the, what, what's Benedum's interest in this artist and this rabble rouser and this like, you know, dreamer? What's the point? Well, um, our interest originally is looking at what looked like a critical mass of entrepreneurs. And these entrepreneurs were, as has been stated here, all operating in their own silos. So one of the advantages of being at a foundation, uh, in addition to people laugh at your jokes no matter how lame they are, is the fact that you get to see a lot of stuff that's going on in different sectors that folks who are really toiling every day don't get to see over the wall. So we saw the opportunity of growing small businesses and creating startups out of the assets of the artist community and the technology community and all of the other business support services. And I want to keep stressing that because they're all operated by different entities. But Kim is trying to be the glue that pulls these different sectors together. And a lot of them, like, there's a university entrepreneurship center who came to one of her festivals and decided, it's a women's entrepreneurship center, it's a Chatham University, and the director said, there are a lot of women here who are artists and artisans who would like to start their own business. And she designed a customized entrepreneurship training program to go along with artists who want to grow their business. So it's a customized plan. So now we introduce entrepreneurship services. Ryan's working with a lender to underwrite one of his incubators. So it's not just the foundation's interest in growing businesses and entrepreneurs. I also want to stress that it's, there's really a cross section of investors in this now. So uh, there's a bank in Pittsburgh that's been a steadfast supporter because they want to show it's Dollar Bank wants to say their, invest, their corporate investment in the community is through the arts. And they have been a steadfast supporter of creative industries. And now we're seeing the logical other corporations like Comcast. Yeah, AT&T. Yeah. 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 So the, the, the spectrum of, of investors is growing really in the same kind of pace as the cross-section of sectors that are involved in the network. 
Ryan, how much of your work is, uh, you kind of sound like you could be a building developer, right? Um, we have an amazing young guy in West Virginia called Brandon Dennison, many of you may know, who has a terrific sort of public, private, profit, nonprofit model around redeveloping abandoned buildings in the southern part of the state. Um, how much of your work is like redeveloping abandoned spaces as a means to an end? Talk me through that nexus. So the, the first building was the hardest because it wasn't, we, we didn't have a plan, we've never done this before. So a lot of the, the, the issues just were how do you create artist space out of what you're given. And so we, we started on a floor that really had everything in place. It had a radiant heat system. It had beautiful glass block windows that let in a lot of light. Um, but once we moved into another space, we had to demolish a ceiling. We had to build walls. We had to put an additional electrical support to service those spaces. And uh, when before you become a, an official entity, you can do things a lot easier. And so I did build a lot of the walls. I did a lot of the electrical work myself. And um, you, you really learn to kind of do things on a shoestring budget now that things are a little bit more legitimized and we do have more support. We have professionals that do the work and we have safety protocols that we follow. Um, but the way that you start things, you have to be willing to, to really invest not only yourself, but your own resources and your blood, sweat, and tears into something and hope that it turns into what you want it to be. I was a volunteer for four years before I started getting paid this year um, to actually run Radiant Hall. Um, but the, the beauty of it is that you put that hard work into it and you follow through on your vision and you're helping other artists and they, they see what you're doing for them. And then the foundations, it's really their role to kind of observe and see what's happening at the grassroots level and meet those organizations halfway when they need the support to grow and really succeed and take it to the next level. So. Um, when I first met Kim, Kim, one of the things that was really interesting to me, I, I'd just been talking to Natalie a lot about the Impact West Virginia Fellowship um, that she launched. If you all haven't heard of it, check it out, impactwv.com. We Impact WV, right? So it's a fellowship to keep smart young people in West Virginia or bring smart young people to West Virginia. Your co-create uh, incubator um, had a really interesting angle about diversity in it. Could you tell the people here how co-create works and what your ambitions are for that? Yeah, sure. Um, a co-create business ignition program. Um, we just launched it. We had our. We just finished our pilot year. It launched last fall and finished at our Create Festival in June. Um, we designed this to fill the gap um, for working artists and creatives to learn business skills. It's a ten-month program. We selected six co-creators this year. And what he's referring to about the diversity in our group is, do you have that slide about the creative industries? Oh, yes. The picture yeah, yeah. up there real quick? Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually on. Yeah, this. So you can see behind me, um, you know, we were kind of herding cats trying to categorize the creative industries because there's just so much of it and it's it's so diverse. But this is this is the best estimation of organization we could come come up with to really reflect the diversity and what the creative industries are. Um, so you can see it, it's everything from fine art to all the way over to software and data. Um, it, it's really ubiquitous in, in pretty much everything we do these days. Um, so with this co-create program, we aim to get one person from each, roughly each sector to come together and work together over a year. And why did we do that? Um, we did a study with the Richard Florida Group about three years ago on the creative industries in Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University. And we wanted to figure out what made creative industries successful. And one identifying factor became uh, directly proportional with a company's success, and that was their ability to work with people different than themselves, to work outside their comfort zone with other creatives from other sectors. So our thought was what happens when you pair a fine artist up with a data science person or a software person or an entertainment person with a communications person and see what happens when these six people work together over the course of a year um, to grow their business and to learn from each other. 
And it was fantastic, I have to say. Um, every single person who left this program was thrilled and had made great connections with all the other co-creators. And it's this process of working together with people different than yourself. I mean, that was really great for them and always makes them think of new things that they wouldn't have thought of if they were just in their own group. And you, you also told me some inter interesting things about diversity in terms of uh, gender, background, race, is one of those things that successful communities and economically successful communities have in common, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah, the, the diversity is, is such an important factor um, and the connectivity. Those are really the two things that came out of that study is people have to be different. You learn from people that are different from self, people that are different innovate, um, but you also have to be connected. Uh, we can't be different and not talking to each other or, or what's the chemistry is not going to happen. You know, we have to, we have to come together. We have to learn from each other and share our ideas. And whether they're young or old or black or white or whatever, all these people have different perspectives that really enrich the creative industries and life in general. Um, so this session, uh, my sneaky implicit uh, purpose for this session is there is a hole in West Virginia at the moment um, for this sort of a network. Um, the Tamarack F Foundation for the Arts does an amazing job of connecting artists, um, but that definition of artists is still kind of mostly traditional glass blowers, printmakers, photographers. Um, and then there are organizations like Generation who are connecting young professionals. There are savvy entrepreneur Megan Bullock is here, who's a creative professional trying to connect people personally. Um, uh, Elaine Sheldon created a Google spreadsheet a couple of years ago that was like, hey, film editors, and how can we all know each other? Um, those dots haven't been joined. And we want to try and join those dots. So between Natalie and Megan and these guys and uh, Renee Margosi is the new executive director of the Tamarack Foundation, um, this is a hole and it's definitely a need. Um, a piece of advice, uh, maybe Jim or, or Kim, given that, what's a really concrete, achievable, if there isn't yet a nonprofit or there isn't yet an organization to, to take that on, what's a first step that people like that in West Virginia can, can take to build that sort of a network? So let me, let me comment on this because I'm the observer of one of the things that Kim started very early on. And these were regular business to business networking events, okay? So whether you wanna do something on a statewide basis or a local community or a county, because there's a, there's a natural community that you wanna work with, all of these sectors are represented in some way. And all, it, I think the early step is to just convene representatives from across sectors in regular social but business to business meetings to talk about what does it take to create this, this cluster. I, yeah, I mean, you could form well. like a, some kind of advisory group or something to start just getting these heads at the tables to talk about it. I think that would be a first step. Um, and then in terms of, you know, what, if you can find someone who wants to own it, ultimately someone's going to have to own it or nothing's going to get done. Um, someone wants to own it and then partner, create a group of partners with that group of ownership. I think Natalie's raising her hand out there. Yeah. <laughs> Should we take a vote? <laughs> Can I, can I add something really quick to you, though, yeah. for those who might not be at the top um, or want to help from the ground up? Because you need the participants buy-in as well and finding more participants. Um, I'm not going to say the quote exactly, but um, the famous baseball player, Satchel Paige, said, you need to show up, right? right? And so just by going to these things that you might not identify as, like, this is what other people have said, that this is for me, Go to those other things, and then you're going to meet strangers that will be your friends and will be your coworkers and be people who cheerlead for you, and you can work together in the future. Right, yeah, and in that regard, in terms of when you're assembling this group of people to start this, I, I completely 100, what? Nice use of the word, assemble. <laughs> I, I know, it was, I did that on purpose. Not really, but... I totally agree with what she said, and that's really important. Um, you can't just bring together a group of people at the top. You need to include working artists and working tech people in that group because you need to know what they need, and it's different everywhere. So I would make that definitely make that group include people on all levels of who are going to be participating and leading. Very rarely were they suits. Can I add one other thing? 
Can, uh, Mary Hunt told me uh, 15, 17 years ago, never underestimate the value of a festival. And I was like, mm. okay. You know, I, I, it was a fortune cookie thing I put away. <laughs> and I can't tell you how true it is because starting with an annual event that celebrates the sector and shows people what, what do these things really look like? What does a creative industry really look like? you really start to show these illustrations. And the Create Festival this year had a 1,000 people. But people could walk away and say, oh, now I get it, before it's just sort of a buzzword. So never underestimate the value of a festival. And, and the first one that we ever did was, the very first one was about 10 years ago, and we did that for like $250. So it's not like you need a big grant or something to do this. We just paid for like some booze and got some chips, you know, and everybody had a blast. And we really struggled with that because everybody had so much fun and it cost nothing. And now we're creating this massive festival and it's like a, a massive production and you want to grow and keep that spirit, that really kind of, that spirit of the heart that these these initial uh, events have. So don't let money be an impediment. You can do it anyway. I just, um, I have a billion questions, but I'll start with one, um, which is that sometimes I think here in this work, um, like I, I look at this and I'm glad that you said 10 years because I'd sort of missed the timeline. And um, so that's really helpful um, when sometimes the wins here feel too small um, about what, when those add up maybe 10 years, we start to be doing something really big. And I wondered if you could talk about what those small wins looked like um, so that we can kind of hold on to those. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Because like I said, when I, when I first started doing this, we didn't have any money. It was the first year was before we even met you. Um, and and we just did, we didn't know what we were doing, honestly. It was like, well, let's just try this. And I think that's real, a really good indicator that you're doing something right. You know, I really like when people say, if you know what you're doing, you're failing. Because you got to keep trying new things, right? And that's what this is all about. So you're not going to, everything's not going to work. You're going to fail sometimes. And that's okay. Because that's part of the exploration process. You got to try things. And if it doesn't work out, you just let it go. And you, and you adjust, you pivot, and you learn from that experience and try something different. But, and, you know, in terms of holding on to the little things, just just in the first event that we had just had so many people that came and it was just that energy and some people liked what they saw some people didn't like what they see because it was something new and they didn't know what they were going to get um, but you're never going to please everybody all the time you just keep having to do the best that you can and aggregating things and learning from the things that don't work out is someone tweeting that if you know what you're doing. You know what you're doing, you're failing. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's brilliant. Nice, nicely done. that to my boss. Yeah, that's good. Um, and it makes me feel better for when I fall on my right. ass. Right. Um, okay, so a couple of points that I wanted to, for the West Virginians that are here, or people in this region that are here and want to plug into some of this, a few things that came across my radar in the last sort of couple of months. This conversation, uh, reaching out to you guys, started with a new company that was moving to northern West Virginia. They're a coding firm. And, they, and I went to meet them just because I meet people and I'm annoying and I pester people until they talk to me, and we did. And they said... We've got to find a, like a branding firm. We're still using our marketing and branding firm from uh, uh, California because there aren't any marketing and branding firms in West Virginia. And I'm like, oh, you've oh, you got to meet Mesh. Man. You've got to meet 84. You've got to meet Impact. There's, man, there's tons. They're great. And they're, how, well, how do we find them? Right? And so this is the challenge that we are dealing with. Right? How do you, apart from Googling, if you don't know these people personally, where does that door, how does that door open? Um, and so as I was searching for a door, I found a couple of interesting things that you all can plug into if it's relevant to you. There's an organization in Morgantown called Build Guild. Um, is anyone here from Build Guild? It, I think they're just dudes who get together and drink beer on a Friday. And they're coders, right? And they share jobs and they, hey, I need two guys for this. Can someone help me? Or, hey, there's a new website project that needs to happen. Um, there is a Slack channel called WV Code um, that is, again, coders just like sharing ideas. Um, in, in Elk City, which many people might know, like, uh, know as uh, Charleston's West Side, um, they're doing this in place. Um, so there's a couple of creative businesses in the street there. Uh, Megan is up the back um, that are trying to do these sorts of events 
events in a physical place that look like a party and that get creative people in the door and talk and they do classes. So there's physical opportunities to do that. In Richwood, um, Chuck is out there. Excellent dude, Chuck. Uh, he has a group called Richwood Scientific that is doing technology and coding education classes in Richwood. Dude's like a California surfer in uh, like central southern West Virginia. Kudos, man. Um, go and learn about them. There's, a, 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 there's a, a company in Charleston called Great Expectations that just opened. It's a think space down near the capital market. Um, there is an organization called the Mountain Arts District. They're out there too. They have a website that's like, hey, this is where all the arts and venues and creative people are in the Mountain Arts District. So these things are happening. Um, connect into them. Um, you know, if, if you can, if that's of interest to you, and if it's not in your area, make it. People want to hang out, right? People want to hang out. Um, any, yes, Megan, Dan. Hi, thanks for all, all of you being here today. Um, I'm Megan. This is kind of an open-ended question, but I'm just interested in hearing your all's take on uh, the tipping point in the work that you've been doing um, over the last 10 years to kind of build on the small wins. The tipping point. I don't know. This might be it. I don't know. Um, they came to news story. Yeah, this is it. You guys are seeing it right now. Yeah, um, yeah I don't know because it really did. I mean, just to clarify, um, like when you started to see things scale in Pittsburgh, because I remember start when I started to hear about it. So just wondering if it was an event for you or something that you saw where, oh, this went from one to ten. Okay, well, I'm just going to answer for me. I don't know. We might we got, everybody might have a different answer to that, but for me, there, there. I wouldn't say there was one tipping point. It was a gradual process. It wasn't like, yay, we just hit it big with this event. It certainly was. It was plugging away, kind of like what I was talking about with Natalie. Just event after event, and one might suck, and the next one's great, and you just keep going on, and eventually you just. It's like a snowball. It was more of a snowball effect, and it just kept gaining momentum and momentum and momentum. So. Yeah, that's that's it. No tipping point, snowball. I'm going to say, uh, not to make it sound bureaucratic, but I think when this sort of organic meeting of folks and connections among the sectors were kind of formalized into this inventory of creative industries, and there are ways of connecting people systematically, it sort of became a thing. Uh, and that was sort of a, uh, a nodal event in this. Yeah, that was definitely an important progression was solidifying it into, from a grassroots perspective into something that was real and tangible. And I mean, really, we've, we've come out with pretty much a new product every year since this started, whether it's changing the Create Festival or doing a study or, you know, creating, we have an inventory of all the, we did an asset map of all the Pittsburgh region's creative industries, and we have this incubator. So part of this whole snowball process is keep bringing new products and keep attracting new people so that the network grows and you reach more people and you're diversifying your products. So it's really important to keep being additive to your work. Don't keep doing the same things over and over again. And when old corporations say they want to be a, they want to sponsor. Yeah. You know, That's always a good sign. When, when you start getting corporate sponsors, you know you're doing some right. And just something else to throw out there, um, you know, like the more participation, the more gravity you have, the more pattern recognition you'll have of like, oh, this is a thing, and then it's an emergent process, right? You guys know what I mean by emergent. You're all techie-ish, and um, things can start to come together, and if it's not self-organizing, you can have a structure where people willingly want to participate and just consider and make it welcoming. And just for those who are creating these businesses, it took three years for things to really like to say like, it's time, you should hire someone. And talking to other businesses and non their nonprofits, like three years seems to be like, if you can make it work for three years, it might be real. I'd, li I'd like to speak to the uh, the issue of um, where do you find other creative people in West Virginia across cross discipline, and um, 
I had an experience I wasn't expecting, I didn't pursue it, but I was asked to sell uh, advertising for a local newspaper. And I wasn't doing anything much, and I never saw myself as an advertising salesperson. But it, it got me out on the road, and I visited every business I could find in three counties. And I found a huge supply of entrepreneurs in three rural counties that are considered to be poor. There is a talent base. They might not have big businesses, but they have creativity. And so uh, another thing I see in common, each of these people here is a, a nodal point in these networks. They went out and talked to people. And all it takes, I mean, sometimes you know, people in my town, they say, how do you know so many people? Well, I just get over myself and talk to them. And be, behind every set of eyes is untapped uh, knowledge and potential and connections. Uh, it's amazing when you start talking to people. And, and to, if you don't talk to people, it's all a mystery. There's so much going on, uh, you don't need to see yourselves as uh, like floating in a, a void. Uh, because uh, you're surrounded by people and they all have their talents. And it's just a, a personal thing. I think we are all creative. We are all creative. And different things bring it out in us. And so if you're witnessing how this person it's brought out in, this person is brought in, uh, out in, you get your uh, cross-fertilization of creativity. I like this dude a lot. He's like, that's, that's the new story ethos, right? Like, there are people out there. Get them in, get them in the house and ask them things. Did you... No. Yeah. Um, the media is on my mind a lot these days in West Virginia. And I am reminded, especially sitting uh, with you guys, of one of my first few weeks in West Virginia, um, Googling, like, attracting and retaining young people, probably, <laughs> when I got this job and was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? But one of the first articles I found that I still read um, was one in the Atlantic about why millennials love Pittsburgh. And they were all of my talking points about why I love West Virginia. <laughs> I was like, how did they get that? <laughs> um, and so, oh uh, yeah, so the, all the quotes are amazing. It's like, hi, I'm a millennial. I um, love living in a place where I can meet real people easily, where I feel like I can make change and impact. Um, the scale is something that I fit in with. I think there's like, it's not a giant city, there's opportunity, there's fun stuff to do, paired with this less bureaucratic red tape and an ability to make your ideas happen. Um, and that was over and over this narrative. And I wanted to know how, how you did that. <laughs> how did the media story start to shift about Pittsburgh? So I want to say it is happening in West Virginia. You know, and, and I'm only familiar with a few communities, but when I look at Wheeling and what Wheelunk is doing and the, and the millennials that are moving in to buy brownstones for a song and setting up artist lofts that are affordable, the things that, that drove the uh, artists out of Soho and then out of Dumbo and wherever else, it's happening here. I think celebrating and publicizing those stories is what is, is the uh, call to the media. You know, young entrepreneurs that are start are moving into those communities to start things. I think it's remarkable. And Mary's tired of hearing this, but I'm telling you that Princeton is is famous worldwide. You know, for the way artists said, we're going to come, we're going to start with a festival because they listened to Mary, and <laughs> now you have an artist colony with businesses moving in. It's it's arts transforming a community. But I think they're there. Just celebrate them. Good question for Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I can kind of talk about that, but um, just to give you some background, Radiant Hall is just under five years old. Uh, we're in three locations. We've are just under half a million dollars in our annual budget. Um, but if you take a, I'm actually going to get to a few different questions that were asked, but. If you take a room this size and imagine essentially artist cubicles, there are eight to 10 of those in this room. The studios are semi-private, so there aren't any doors, which means that the artists are forced to interact with one another and to, to share their information and to kind of help each other. And that's how each Radiant Hall location is set up. And so it's really more of this uh, 
community location where artists get to know each other. They talk about their networks and they get to know the professional tactics of, of how do you stabilize your career? How do you find patrons? How do you build what you're, you're, you're working on? Um, but how we did that, it, it's, a, it's a perfect storm of uh, connections to real estate developers. I mean, we, we use the, the whole paradigm in, in, in uh, New York was that developers would use artists to essentially fill old warehouses where they could turn a quick buck and kind of keep the lights on. And then once the market developed, they would push them all out and develop the high rise. As artists, we need to learn about that process and flip it. And so developers now are seeking artists to move into these spaces to activate them and to become agents of change. Um, and a lot of arts groups and artists jump on the bandwagon and they're like, great, we got a good deal on this space. And they kind of move in and, and that's like, okay, we're here, now we're, we're kind of done. And then five years forward, they're getting kicked out of those same spaces. Radiant Hall's mission is once we fill up the space, we're already putting connections together. We're, we're meeting with people. We're talking to foundations and banks and um, other developers to come up with a plan to transition out of that space into a permanent one, either in that same neighborhood or near it. And so you have to create the model um, to project that you're successful. And so once you have the success, you can leverage that to have other conversations with different stakeholders. And that's what we've done and what we're continuing to do. And so it, I hope that gives you a little bit more of like a timeline of how change does happen. But you need to be proactive about not just being successful, but how do you preserve your success once all the energy is gone. And in, in terms of your question about the media and getting publicity about these things um, and taking things like this, when, when you have a big story, that's when they pay attention the most. So if you can find your hooks, find, find what the story is in these things that, that's relevant to the moment and try to build these relationships with the media to, to get it and put it out there. And I know like all these guys have done a really good job of doing that and telling your stories in a way that, that people are interested in a timely way. Um, okay, so first, Jake, um, there is an organization in, in West Virginia called Create West Virginia. Um, I, I found out about them last month and then went to one of their meetings in Charleston, so um, I can get you information about that. Uh, but particularly for Kim, I, 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 I want to go back to this idea of breaking down silos um, because I'm an engineer and I have the hardest time trying to convince other engineers that this stuff is important, that the creativity is important, that, 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 that they should, um, one of the, my, my, my sidelines at work is working with um, STEM programs and I'm constantly trying to convince my fellow engineers that it has to be STEAM. We have to include the arts in this. Absolutely. So, so how, how, how from, from that perspective, how do you reach the, 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 the sort of... Like the technology tech, side, tech right? Guys, yeah. yeah, like to reach the tech guys. Well, that's a good question for me because um, I feel your pain because I, I, I worked at the Technology Council and when we started this, they're like, I literally, I wasn't joking about the hate mail thing. It was the night before Christmas and, and I got an email like 12 miles long, which is always a bad thing. You know, that's never good when you see that. And um, I was like, uh-oh, and I read it. And it was pretty much to the long story short, I don't want all of my technology council membership money going to art, right? Like, and how, like, whoa, art's not worth anything. And, and of course, I'm freaking out. I was like, oh my gosh, you just don't understand. You don't understand. And, and, and I think the issue is really a lack of awareness because I called that guy up because I was like, I got to straighten the situation out. And by the end of our conversation, we're like best friends. And he's like, oh my God, I never thought of it that way, right? Like, what is, what is this art? I never really realized that art was actually design and inf engineers need to have good design because if you're going to design crappy things, they're going to fall apart even if the engineering's good. You know, there's a constant design element, right? If our cars aren't designed well, all of this stuff has to be intuitive and it has to not only work, but it has to have good design. So when people start to understand that the word 
creativity doesn't just apply to, you know, sketchbooks and music and the things that we typically think of that are amazing. It's, it's so many more things that are just being invented every day, the jobs that didn't even exist 10, 20 years ago. So when you start to frame things in terms of innovation, and um, use, always use Apple as an example. I mean, that's from the dawn of time. They were like the first people that did that. Steve Jobs was a really you know, big supporter of innovation and creativity working together. And that's why we have all these really intuitive computer project, products instead of the old IBMs. So, all right, I know we have time. So yeah, hopefully that answered your question. That's awesome. So um, before we leave out, so if, you, if creating a makerspace in your downtown, if there's a building you want to make some use of, if you think getting kids and families in to make stuff, talk to Nina, right? If you are interested in perhaps redeveloping some of your properties to encourage artists to move in and do stuff, Ryan is right here. Like grab him before he gets out the door. Talk to these people. Talk to Kim and talk to Jim. This is why we do New Story is to suck them dry for all their information. Um, so in a minute, so uh, to continue on the creative sort of placemaking track, um, in a five or ten minutes right here is going to be a little kind of breakout session from a couple of really interesting people who created local food tours and food festivals in their neighborhoods, right, with, with nothing, just because they like to eat and they like to hang out with people. And it's a really great community development strategy. And in here, in five or ten minutes, are uh, three amazing West Virginians who created an app called Ose which is about sticking it to your legislators to make sure they listen to you and using social media to do that. So let's have a five or 10 minute break and then get back in here. But first round of applause for Pittsburgh. Yeah.